you are only in control of falling asleep. So just own the first 15 minutes, let's say, of a, of a, of a sleep ritual. Then whatever happens in the middle of the night happens within the middle of the night. The lifestyle habit is only, not to think about the whole night sleeping in this position. It's just to set yourself up within the first 15 minutes or let's say half an hour, 45 minutes of falling asleep in this structural position and then let the body do whatever it's going to do in the middle of the night. Hey guys, we've got an awesome guest this week here to improve your sleep today. I freaking am here for who raise your hand if you don't want to improve your sleep. <laughs> Honestly, this podcast episode made Rachel a non-believer to a believer by the end, so I think you guys are really going to enjoy the expert we have on today. You're going to love it. It's Dr. Peter Martoni. He's been a chiropractor, a speaker. He has been on some really really banger podcasts. Um, including Ben Greenfield. He's he's been featured on Fox, NBC. He is the sleep expert. He is hot right now because sleep is hot right now. And um, he's even developed a product to help you sleep better, which is his custom pillow. If you want a, um, a look at this, you can head to his website, necknest.com. Dot com, and we have a discount code for you for listening to the podcast. It's CVG10. So enjoy this one. He was great. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Thick Thighs Save Lives podcast. I'm Kelsey. And I'm Rachel. Welcome back, guys. We have a special guest for you today. We have Dr. Peter Martoni, or Marton if you're outside of Mass, but we're a bunch of Mass holes here, <laughs> so yes, we're yeah. going with it. Um, he is a chiropractor, an educator, and a speaker. Known as Dr. Sleep Right, guys. So if you have ever struggled with sleep, if you have questions about sleep, if you just are looking to maximize your ability to human, we have the expert here. Welcome, Peter. Well, thank you guys for having me. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, sleep is a major topic for us and everyone always, it's like this magical thing though. Everyone always wants to wake up rested and, and feel like they've had a good sleep, um, but sometimes we have trouble prioritizing our sleep or just getting a restful night's sleep as we're there. Um, so can you tell us what are the keys to getting a good night's sleep? Wow. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's just dive right into it. All right. Fantastic. I love it. No bull crap. And let's, uh, let's dive in. Well, the key is right. So the average person will toss and turn 20 to 40 times a night. And that is called, that's a very disruptive sleep. So when you look at sleep, as far as like you fall asleep at, let's say, you know, 10 o'clock and you wake up at seven o'clock and that's, a you know that's a nine hour schedule i think so if it if you fall asleep for nine hours not all nine hours is considered equal some because you have to go through nice quality you know sleep cycles a lot of times people take medication they exercise too late they have too much caffeine so there are so many variables that um that really affect somebody's ability to wake up well rested and refreshed a lot of people will stay asleep for seven, six, seven, eight hours, but they're not getting really good quality of sleep. So, so I think really one of the, the biggest keys is looking at sleep as not all sleep is created equal. And I think we should really dive into some of the misconceptions that, that, that come to, you know, there's so many experts say so many different things about sleep. I'm like a functional sleep person. I zigzagged into the industry. I didn't, I'm not in the industry because I wanted to help people sleep better. I'm in the industry because I needed to correct my own issues that I had because I was helping people with their structure for 20 years. And then I herniated my own disc and I figured that I could fix it at night when I slept. And now, holy mackerel, once I dove into the industry, there were so many misconceptions. Yeah. Don't you feel like that's how some of the best experts have come out though? Like some people 100%. Who have personally struggled with a thing and then they're like, I fell into this because this became so important and so imperative in my life that all of a sudden I needed to find out everything about it and then ultimately share that with everyone else. 
Yeah, I remember, you know, I'm an exercise physiologist, so I was a professional trainer in Australia before I w went into my kind of chiropractic world. And I can still remember waking up after the gym, going to the gym, waking up, and I can't move my neck for four days, right? Rock climbing in, in some of the cliffs off of the uh, ocean where we were. And then now I'm sleeping on my shoulder. Now I can't move my shoulder for three days. And I had pain all the time. And I always just attributed it, oh, I'm in the gym all the time or exercise. And I lived with it, thinking that it was normal because it was just me and not realizing that the implications of how my sleeping position and the way I was sleeping was reinforcing that damage that I'm doing in the gym or I'm at a computer all day. And, and, and the more that we have these modern day lifestyles of being at a computer and texting and all that forward head posture, sleep is more important. Positional sleep is more important now than ever. That's a great point. I, you know, we spend so much of our life sleeping. And when we think about the hour at the gym and we sort of like blame that for all the pain or, you know, it, it's such a small percentage of our time where if we were looking bigger picture into the things that we're doing for hours on hours on hours, every single day, the repetitiveness of it, it's a really interesting deep dive. And if we could talk a little bit about sleep posture and the spine, you know, you are a chiropractor, you have expertise in this area. And it's my understanding that your belief is that sleep posture is one of the most important aspects when you're talking about corrective sleep. And I really appreciate your background because you, you did a deep dive. You didn't call it sleep position, right? You called it sleep posture and we call it corrective sleep posture, which is fantastic because we, you know, my main goal is to, allow, I, I love to do things while I'm sleeping. Like how, think about improving your structure while you sleep or, or being able to improve your health while you sleep, while you're taking those eight hours at night and people just try to fall asleep, right? We're always, we've always been told, go to sleep, but nobody really taught us how to sleep. So, you know, I went to bed as a child, my, my, if you can imagine in Malden, Massachusetts is where I grew up right on a busy road. And my, my uh, window, my, the, the head of my bed was at the window on the back, on the front porch. And there was a bus stop. So I always thought as a child that somebody was going to smash through my window and steal me, right? So, you know, I always went to bed afraid. Mm -hmm. So, well, what did that do? That made me curl up in a ball and put pillows all over me and create safety. So when we fall asleep, we believe that we are falling asleep and we feel comfortable. We don't feel comfortable, we feel safe. And, and we fall asleep feeling protected. So when we fall asleep in these positions, they're not sustainable. It, but what that's doing is it, the, the, the positioning is going against the structure of your spine, destroying the structure of your spine. And because of specific laws in the body, and the main one is that body posture, right? Everybody talks about posture, I have bad posture, bad posture. Body posture adjusts to head position. It's called the writing reflex. So when we curl down in a little ball and we have this, it's causing this forward head posture. And that forward head posture reacts by causing a psoas major muscle spasm, which is the psoases. A lot of people have constricted psoases and it rotates your hips. So it's going to cause a short leg. It's going to cause the hips to be out of alignment. It's going to cause consistent back pain and you're going to stretch it. You're going to exercise it. You're going to create imbalances and you're going to end up with labrum issues. And everybody thinks like I did as a chiropractor too, that the problem's in the back, but it's not. It was due to forward head posture related to my sleeping on my side, curl up in a ball. Wow. That's a really good point. I've talked to Rachel about this. I know she's feeling personally attacked by that. I am sleeping in a ball. Um, yeah, <laughs> because we did, a, <laughs> we did a podcast. Which I'm sorry, but I know you can handle it coming from where you are. <laughs> yeah. And um, just like we had talked about like a, a posture expert who had, she had mentioned how you wake up 
um, you know, is a reflection of how you're feeling in your life. And if you wake up, you know, in a ball and, and just kind of thinking about how you're looking for safety. And I talked to Rachel about that and just like how we can look at that alignment and think about like different ways to kind of adjust that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going off script a little bit here, but like, what would you say to some people who constantly find themselves waking up in a ball like that? Which I think it's such a great question. So the reason people will toss and turn is because of three reasons. First off, it's because the body is in pain and you're not in a sustainable position. Second, because the body doesn't feel safe. And third, because the body is running too hot or too cold. Most of the time it's too warm. So if we can identify the, the three main reasons people toss and turn, we can then put the body into a corrective sleeping posture and address all three of those things at the same time. So when you look at the physiology, I'm developing a, a, a program. It's a, going to be a certification program called the, uh, the Neurostructural Protocol. And the, what the Neurostructural Protocol is, the way to look at somebody, because we sense our lives through our, our nervous system. And how we sense reality is basically how we interpret it. And then what we tell you is just an interpretation of what we, how we believe that reality was expressed. But reality lives within your nervous system. So I can look at people and tell them what's wrong with them based on the way they stand, how they sleep. So if we look at that, we can then address those things while people are sleeping. So number one, how do you address safety? You, is safety a sympathetic dominant state? Or a parasite. So when we sleep, do we want to be sympathetic dominant, which means do we want to be running from a tiger or do we want to be parasympathetic dominant, rest, heal, digest? So we want to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system because when we feel safe, it engages our hormones, it engages our, our safe systems. You do that by using pressure. You use pressure over your eyes with like, let's say a sleep mask. You use a pressure like a pillow over your head use pressure on your chest. What you're in a sense doing when you're sleeping on your side, curled up in a ball, is you're creating this safe pressure position. It's almost like an ostrich sticking its head in the ground to feel safe, right? So you can create this environment where you use pressure on your head, pressure on your chest, and then you can put like a sleep mask because we, we find is just pressure on the eyes themselves improves what's called heart rate variability by 30%. So if you use pressure, you can create safety, and then you use positioning to decrease pain. You do both of those together, and you're, it's going to be a game changer for you. All right. I'm, I, okay. I'm <laughs> with you. I'm with you. But I know, and, and I'm, I want you to explain to our listeners, there is an ideal sleep posture. There is. And womp womp it's on your back <laughs> i can't do that i oh, can't you, you do it a minimizing word. you say can't that's I, that's not that's no we don't want minimizers we want listen how do i start to transform my body because once you fall asleep you are not in control and and kelsey we know that we always want to be in control right <laughs> yeah. so we have to be able to to just to, as having the, you know, the type of brain that likes to race, we like to be in control. You are only in control of falling asleep. So just own the first 15 minutes, let's say, of a, of a, of a sleep ritual. Then whatever happens in the middle of the night happens within the middle of the night. We just, the lifestyle habit is only, not to think about the whole night sleeping in this position. It's just to set yourself up within the first 15 minutes or let's say half an hour, 45 minutes of falling asleep in this structural position and then let the body do whatever it's going to do in the middle of the night because you're not in control when you fall asleep. So what does that mean? You're going to roll onto your side if you're not feeling safe enough. But if you do this every single night and you start out like this, eventually over a period of weeks, months, a year, the body will unwind and it will be the only position you will ever want to sleep in. There's hope. There's, there hope. Hope. There's hope for you. And, and, that's what, like, and that's what a lot of the programs that most of, I, it's easy for me to, let's say, give somebody a pillow that works, tell them to sleep in this position. The hardest part is 
because you know I'm transforming spines. People were not holding their adjustments coming into my office year in, year out, year in, year out, because they're all throwing themselves out of alignment at night when they were sleeping. So it was easy for me to say, oh yeah, I found the greatest sleeping position. So just do this. Nobody can do it because there are so many obstacles that come up because it's a subconscious brain. It starts with how we fall asleep. If you are thinking yourself to sleep, so if you're thinking, you're never going to get a good night's sleep. You have to remember yourself to sleep. So you have to access good memories in the past versus thinking because then you're not in your conscious brain and you're going to toss and turn all night long. So there are so many tips to to be able to help you do this. So yes, you can't do it now, but you will be able to do it with training. Can I just ask one follow up question on this? Because I'm uh, this is I'm not a uh, a great like you know I'm not a, like a dead sleeper like once I'm asleep that's it I'm very big toss and turn. If I wake up you know multiple times in the middle of the night, should I reposition myself to that or should I just go with however I've landed? Can you do me a favor? <laughs> Absolutely, right. I'm committed. I'm committed. All right. So this is what I'm going to do. So. You have a camera that you're looking at me through, correct? Yes. Make a circle and then look at me through that circle, real small circle, and then bring that back to your eye. Okay, you're left-eyed. Now, are you right-handed? Yes. Okay, so you're cross-dominant. So you have a gift, and that gift is a, I don't know a brain. If you call yourself right-handed. <laughs> so, so one of the issues with the ADD brain, which you also have, is is that cross dominance, it craves protection, okay? It craves protection, it craves con- control, it is an internalizer, you, you're an internalize a lot of negative self-thought. So there's a lot of internalizing of that type of brain, okay? Okay, we just met. I'm just saying, I just want <laughs> to- oh. He just described my whole life, but like we just met, so. Sorry, I freak people out when I That's, do this. That was I, you just- have digestion a- issues, your earrings, you sprained your right ankle, you can't turn your head to the left. So all of this stuff is all, this, uh, this is my neurostructural protocol. So I can look at people and tell them what's going on, right? Just by based on, because your neurology is telling me what's going on. It's not what somebody tells me. Okay, so now I have to go look past what you're telling me. I can't sleep like that. Right. And now I need to talk to the to the internal you that I understand very well of why you can't sleep. So let's talk to the internal you. Okay, so the internal you is that there's a certain time of night when you wake up in the middle of the night where the blood's in both portions of the brain, the conscious brain and the subconscious brain. It is a very addictive time to think. It's a very, because what happens, you can think about everything. You can solve problems that you can't solve during the day. And you're going to be like, what the, how, oh my God, I got to remember that. You're never going to remember it because it clears the slate right when you fall asleep. So somebody like you gets very, it gets very disruptive sleep because subconsciously, and, and you don't live your life through your conscious brain. You live your life on subconscious patterns. So what ends up happening is your 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 intuition, I guess you can say, mastered patterns of of perception. You're 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 able to like live in this really cool world, but it's de- going to destroy your sleep. So it's not that you're not getting great sleep because you can't. Your body physiologically can't. It's you don't know how because you have that cross dominant brain that that loves to think and solve problems. That makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was like the best therapy session I ever had. Well, I, I love how you put that too, that that's a really addictive time to kind of like wake up and solve problems. Because I think a lot of people have just found themselves being like, all right, I fall asleep. But at this time every night or, you know, when I'm feeling particularly anxious or when, um, you know, I have something that's really weighing on me, I wake up and I'm like, that's the time to solve it. And I'm like, 3 a.m. That's not the time. <laughs> like, like my conscious brain is like, 3 a.m. is not when we solve this problem. But ultimately, like your body and your mind, like wants to wake up at that time and be like, "This is, we're gonna hammer this out right now." <laughs> I can't. I can't remember who it was. I think it was either Albert Einstein or, or I'd have to look back or Ben Franklin. So they used to come up with these problems, right? 
And they used to understand you have to get into this subconscious sleep state in order to solve them. Because like I said, it's this, this, this area where, where the blood is in the, the full portions of the brain. It's almost like the reason why we, uh, you know, we, I, I come up with this program called rest before you test. It's always better instead of pulling an all nighter to wake up in the morning yeah. because to study, because you retain more information. So they used to, Ben Einstein, one of them, I can't remember who it was, don't quote me on this, but they used to hold these thimble, these balls, and they used to lie in a couch and they put these thimbles on the on the ground, like, you know, like the those things. And they would fall, they would go into, when they came up and had a problem, they would go into this rested sleep, try to fall asleep, start to think about it. And right before they, because once you doze off in your sleep, you clear the slate. And then what happens is, you know, when you go to sleep, you go paralyzed. So they drop the thimbles, wake themselves up and come out of that state with the answer to the question. So, so, you know, you have to be really careful with thinking in the middle of the night because you think you're solving problems and then you're going to say, oh my God, I got it. I'm going to keep it on my mind until the morning. I just right. can't get it. Yep. I can't get it. How the heck? Are you going to be able to get to sleep doing yes. that? How do yeah. I know it's so bad? Because my mental brain yeah. lives in a cross-dominant state. So that's how I understand the neurology so well. Well, I really, that's, a, that's a also rest before you test. I'm like keeping that forever because that's a really great way to put it. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? Just like come back to this, wake up early, do it in the morning because right now I'm not at my best. And then even though I know I'll have less time in the morning, I'll be better. I'll be more productive. I'll be able to get twice the amount of things done than I will be able to at night sometimes. But I think this is a really good um, segue into a question that I had for you about like, we can understand that poor sleep affects a workout. Like in our minds, we can really um, conceptualize that. But when it comes to, you take it a step further and you talk about the connection to sleep performance with ADHD, anxiety, depression, um, brain fog, nervous system dysregulation, um, even weight loss, gut health. Can you talk about this a little bit and what that correlation is? Yeah. So in, um, so I'm currently writing a book and in that book, we're trying to, I'm trying to make everything make sense. Right. Yeah. And because it's so, I mean, you put a lot, how can all of that be related? And it is. And everybody's like, Oh, sleep affects everything. You know, posture affects everything, but everybody says everything. Like how, how is it all related? Right. So when you wake up in the morning, I mean, how familiar is your audience with something that's called heart rate variability? Have you, spoken about heart rate variability at all we have HRV a little reading. bit it people would so anyone with a whoop knows what an hrv is <laughs> but um I, I mean giving them a little background would be helpful okay so your body is controlled by two different states let's say right you have the survival state which everybody knows of right running from a tiger and then you have the you know thrive state, which is where your body heals and repairs. So if you, let's think about sleep or those two systems. Like if you're going to have an iPhone or a cell phone on and you're going to want a bunch of performance out of it, or you're going to use all of the apps, right? All at the same time. And you're using all the apps. You're going to drain the battery, which is your internal battery. The body has a fail safe where this doesn't. So, so a lot of times people will put those extra batteries on the edge. Your extra battery is called cortisol or the adrenal glands. So you can make up with that drain energy through hormonal stimulation. But if you don't plug this in enough, you're going to consistently drain. You're going to run the whole system down. Your plugging in is the opposite system, which is the thrive systems which is the parasympathetic nervous system. So you have the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. Well, the sympathetics are like cardiovascular system, heart rate, core, core body temperature. So your body's going to want to survive before it's going to thrive. So you can't run from a tiger and eat a sandwich at the same time, right? So your grandmother always said, don't eat and go swimming because the digestive tract's going to get shut down in lieu of keeping you above water. So... So you have these states, it's called allostatic load, where the body wants to survive before it wants to thrive. Now, here's where 
all of the, <laughs> this is where I believe the problem lies within our entire current system. Everybody believes that they're sympathetic dominant always, right? We, we run sympathetic dominant. We are. So it's, so we meditate, right? We use the little lotions, right? You know, right. And we do these things. I mean, tell a guy from Boston to meditate. I didn't know what meditation was. <laughs> Forget about it. But now I, now I meditate. I can do it. And Me too. I, I've been working on it. <laughs> we're working on it. We, yeah. like, we don't like to let go, so it's a little tough for us. So then you, we use sense, right? And, and, and we do all of these things because we believe we're sympathetic dominant, which we are. But nobody, it, it, instead of only one MD in the country, from what I have found, has ever talked about parasympathetic inhibition which means you have low vagal tone. So heart rate variability is a way to determine the, the, the balance of the two systems. And most of the time, you want to be really balanced. You want your heart rate to be really variable, which tells you you have a good balance between the tones. When we're sympathetic dominant, we're going to have low heart rate variability readings. When we're balanced, we're going to have higher heart rate variability readings. So the one time you go to the gym and you feel strong, more than likely you got good rest and your HRV went really, really high. But this low vagal tone comes from forward head posture, which I'm going to say 90% of all patients that come into my office that have any issues with digestion, hormonal imbalance, and immune system function because they're all thrive systems, they're all controlled by the parasympathetic nerve or the vagus nerve which comes out right underneath the ear. So when you have a nice curve like this in the spine, that vagus nerve is going to be unimpinged. Think of a hose with good flow. When you lose forward posture because we're sleeping in this position, we compromise the integrity of the vagus nerve, which that nerve is it's like almost like stepping on a hose. Mm -hmm decreasing vagal tone, suppressing immune system, digestive system, and reproduction so our body doesn't thrive. So we're going to the gym, we're expecting all of our apps to be open on our phone, and we run down and we crash. And I typically see people crashing in their late 30s, 40s, 45, and 50. So more, most people, I've done this my whole life. And now, that, now they're coming into me, oh my God, I have you know, I, I just got Lyme or, or I'm chronically fatigued or I have COVID long haulers. All of, in order to have that stuff down the road, there's been a life of parasympathetic inhibition mm -hmm. and, a, 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 and a relative sympathetic dominance. Woo. Wow. Does that make sense? You crushed. You crushed. <laughs> and, you know, we've, our listeners will be familiar because we've had a significant amount of digestive specialists on here speaking about the vagus nerve and how your body and brain talk to each other about, you know, what kinds of foods are, um, are benefit, benefiting you and, and what are not serving you and how that like digestive tract issues can just be so, but thinking of it in that way of an actual hose that's being squeezed is such a chiropractor thing to say, <laughs> first of all. So great. And it. it also makes so much sense with the current state of the world and the positioning that we are constantly in. Yeah. It's, you know, it's no, you know, when you talk to most people, right, they're going to have well, not most people. When you talk to a lot of people in our current culture, I mean, we deal with thousands and thousands of different patients. They all have issues in one of three areas or all of them at the same time. Immune system, digestion, reproduction. You talk to teenagers and kids in school, most of them have anxiety, right? So they all have anxiety because they're just, just at the current state of this world. They're really running high stress. My daughter right now is in college. So you have a high sympathetic state and they're all sleeping like this and they're all, you know, have their backpacks and they're, all their heads are forward. So mm -hmm. when you have high sympathetic stress with altered postural biomechanics because of our backpacks and the way that our world is, and we're all side sleepers because <laughs> we're curled up in a ball, they all have digestion issues, hormonal imbalances, 
and uh, and immune system dysfunction. And everybody is going from from organ to organ to organ, trying to treat the organ yeah. when nobody looks at it from a 360 foot view saying, everybody has the same problems. So we have to all have the same patterns. So what is going on with our culture? And that's how I backed into this whole sleep industry. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point because we have, everyone does go from organ to organ without really looking at, and what we've tried to talk about from a holistic standpoint on this podcast in general is that, you know, it's not just your fitness. It's not just your lifestyle. It's not just, it's, it's not just any of these one things. Like we have to back up and figure out like what is going on in all of our lives? What is happening? How can we kind of look at our life from a, from a, a, a whole standpoint? Yeah. in and, and just like hearing you talk, this is the vagus nerve. Yeah. I mean, it goes down to the entire system. So when we're looking at waking up in the morning, right, we're really tired, but we're going to the gym, we're pushing it and we're just drained. And then you're going to the gym and you just can't lose weight. And, and you're like, oh, my God, you know, the, 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 I, I can lose it. But then when I have, you know, I, I have one cheat day, all of it comes back. Yep. You know, you, they live, you're living in such a survival state yeah. that what's the body want to do when you live in survival? It wants to pack on and retain energy for another day. So they, you, you'll fast. I fast. I'm an intermittent faster. A lot of times I go 24 hours, four hours without eating. It's great. And, but once you eat the, it, it, you're still maintaining what's called a set point. That set point is an average of your entire life. Yeah. So you add one thing in and think you're going to change a set point. It's not going to happen. You need to first put the body into a state that the body is able to then get rid of that ex excessive fat and it needs to be in a balanced state. It can't be in a sympathetic dominant state because you'll just put it back on. It's love season. It's the We're season interrupting of this love. podcast to tell you about the season of love. Oh my God. I love love. Don't you love love? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do. Yeah. Okay. You can't really go back on that statement. It was like a you already you already went too far down that road. You don't love love, but we have our Valentine's collection dropping, and it's for the lovers of love and the anti lovers of love because we got that Avril pattern, which I feel is anti love. Listen, you can go in either directions. You could go self-love, love with a mate, love with a partner, whatever you want to do, but it already dropped this past Friday and is available for purchase right now. And if you haven't checked out any of our shirts, uh, we get some pretty sassy ones for Valentine's Day. We always do it really nice. Um, so pick up all of your goods for this upcoming February um, and just plan it. Get hot. Oh, that's, you know, and, and the – you know, the messaging of you must be lying, you need to lower your calories again to, you know, run on what a small child runs on, just <laughs> all of these things without addressing the actual problem is just, you know, that's just been health and fitness for so many years. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's frustrating. And, you know, that's the purpose of, you know, the podcast and bringing on incredibly knowledgeable guests like you. Um, I want to talk for a second about the pillow because we've talked about sleep posture. We've talked about the, um, the head positioning that can be so detrimental to basically every system running in your body. So let's talk about what you've developed in order to combat this. So I, you know, have, um, I developed what's called the neck nest and I can show somebody as much as I can how to use it, the positioning of it, which I will. And that's why I love to start with the why, like we just did, right? How much is affected? This isn't just about getting a great night's sleep. It's about changing your structure while you sleep, and then good sleep will come, right? So, so don't start. We want to start with the end in mind, but understand that it takes a period of time to get this way. Yeah. And just like, you know, whenever there's a delta, right, it's called uh, homeostasis. So the delta is that change. So anytime the body's changing, whether you go, whether you, um, you know, start smoking, you're a smoker, and then you stop smoking. Well, stop smoking is arguably a good thing, 
but that delta change, the body doesn't like. It likes to stay the same. So when I show you this positioning, like, 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 like you, Rachel, you're going to say, I can't do it. No way. There's no way. And I get it. And I, I love you. I nurture you. Uh, uh, hold on. I'm trying to listen better. I, I see you. I hear you. What you say matters. And, uh, but it, you have to understand, I'm just putting you in this position to start the night out. Then whatever happens in the middle of the night, let it happen. And you mentioned earlier, should I put myself back into this position? If you feel it's right, you can. But all I want to do is own the first 15 minutes of when you fall asleep. That's where I live. Mm-hmm. Other sleep specialists can help you down the road. I'm going to teach you how to manage your airway when you fall asleep, you know, how to put yourself into the positioning to be able to give your body the best chance to end up that way. You can put a glass of water in my chest and it will still be there when I wake up. I don't move and I'm never in pain anymore. Why? Because my body is like clay and it's remolded to an aligned position. Does this look aligned? That is the definition of shoulder impingement syndrome or rotator cuff problems or hip issues. All right. A hundred percent. I'm also glad you mentioned the airway because I had done a lot um, when I was first, you know, starting to look at the research behind sleep and um, just listening to some different experts. Um, There was someone had come on a podcast I was listening to and he specifically was talking about the correlation between, you know, your airways, like how it was nasal breathing versus breathing through your mouth and like different ways, like how that affects your Um, like brain chemistry, how that affects ADHD specifically. And there was so, I mean, it's something that we think kind of little about because we're all just breathing all the time. And you think your body knows how to breathe, but that's not true. You have to really like teach yourself how to breathe correctly, especially for some people where it doesn't come quite as naturally. And there's no better place to kind of hone in on that than while you're sleeping because you're not like if you put yourself in that position to be able to breathe a little bit better, you're going to affect so many other aspects of your life. That is great, Kelsey. <laughs> Rachel, this is for you. I just did a, uh, I just did an Instagram on uh, Doctor at Doctor Sleep Right, and it states you fall asleep on your exhale in the hold. That's where you fall asleep. You do not fall asleep on your inhale. When you inhale, picture, you inhale sympathetic dominance, exhale parasympathetic dominance. So when you exhale, it's important to hold. So you're breathing, right? You let your breath out, focus on the breath out. And then there's a natural pause. That natural pause, don't force an inhalation, but let that fall asleep within that pause. And then your body will inhale. And then exhale slow, fall asleep on that pause, focus on that pause, focus on your exhalation, just relaxing it. That's where you'll be able to fall asleep. If you fall asleep focusing on something rhythmic or or a or a memory, you'll you'll fall asleep and you'll stay asleep. You can never fall asleep thinking about things, okay? Mm-hmm. So that's a great that's a great um, that's a great point. So I'm going to show you the position to fall asleep in. I'm going to put you into the position right now, Rachel, because knowing that you have that brain that goes, you're not going to want to lie flat because if you lie flat, you're going to feel like you're falling down or you're going to fall backwards. Another thing that somebody like you is going to have because of that, you lean to that right side. You also are constricted in this forward plane. That's just based on your neurology. So so you're going to end up with knee issues. You'll end up with like piriformis issues that will always need to be stretched because you're leaning forward. So then when I put you into this position, you're going to feel like you're falling backwards. So with somebody like you, I would use elevated sleeping to do this. I'm first going to show you how I fall asleep. Then I'm going to show you how somebody like you should fall asleep to start this, to be able to be a little bit safer. Okay. Okay. All right. So can you see that the, this little neck nest down here? Mm-hmm. So the way that, that, that we have the neck nest right now is I put it on its edge and you can do this with a rolled up towel or a, or, or a pillow and then, you know, on its edge 
and I put it right to my shoulders, right against my shoulders. Then I take the neck nest and I put it right under my neck. So the neck nest is under my neck, but the weight of my head is off of the back of the neck nest. So it's almost elevated. It's almost like suspended in space. So what that's doing is whenever you support the body, you weaken it. So if you use arch support or back support or any support weakens the body, whether it's a nutrition, I forget. So any support weakens the body. So most people, a pillow defined as a support for your head, or a lot of people will have these cervical supports for their, their neck or these, these cervical pillows. Anytime you support the head, you're going to, the, the arch is going to fall down. Okay. So it's not, that's why I, I'm really careful to say, oh, be a back sleeper. No, we want to set you up in the right posture. You want to put a, maybe a support under your neck, but use the weight of the head to, to almost like act like a slinky or, or just distracting. So you're gently stretching the neck, using the weight of the head as a distraction force, which that reinforces the curve in the neck. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So knowing that I, you know, my head's back and I'm going to fall back with somebody like you, I would do things a little bit different. I'd use a slightly elevated sleeping position. So we can do that the very inexpensive way. You can take a normal pillow, put it up uh, on the, uh, on the end of the bed. You could take, let's say another pillow if you want and put it right below it. Then your neck nest or your, your pillow can be on the back of that. So that, in a sense, creates this little elevation, okay? So then when you sleep, and then we're going to get you all, all tucked in with a nice little sleep mask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tucked in. That's good. That's good. Hold on. I'm not done yet with you. <laughs> then we're going to get a comfy little co covers, right? <laughs> Hold on. This, this, this is a show, right? We're going to put on a show right now. I love, listen, I all love right. sleeping. All so. right. So now. We're going to come over here, we're going to sleep here, we're going to create a light little cocoon here. Maybe I'll get this, I'll put that on me too. So, I can't wait to see I sleep cocoon. down here, okay? Hey, oh, I might fall asleep on you. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I got my neck nest under my neck. Oh my God, I'm feeling so good about myself. Right? So, I got my covers. Your, co your body only cares about your core. Right? It only cares about from your like thighs up to your neck. So I keep my arms and my feet out of the covers, but, but I take my covers and I stick it under my chin right here to keep my neck back and to keep my mouth closed. Mm, yeah, you got to keep your mouth I closed. I focus <laughs> on that breath out of my nose. And I focus on that exhale through my nose. I suck my tongue to the roof of my mouth. And it's easy to do that by having, when you have those covers underneath your chin. I've used chin straps with people. I just, it's easier to just use your covers because you have your covers every night up there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I liked that. I liked the way that looked. I've never felt that back sleeping looked comfortable ever. Yeah. It looks like a coffin. Well, that's what she always you says. You seem like a coffin. Nice this though, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I feel so safe. <laughs> You got to address the problem, the safety. Half the positions I wake up and I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> yes. Leg up. Like, yeah, yeah. Your body's nuts. like, what are you doing to me? And then she's like, why do I have back pain? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. yeah well, we can talk about that. Better. Better work on your balance. Wow. Wow. That, but that looked really cozy. Yeah. It is. Once you create that, and, and, and really what's important, especially, um, you know, I'm, I'm like an older individual, but once you get a little older and stuff like that, and we create our own heat, especially if you sleep with somebody else in the bed, it's very important to have your own covers because you're a heater and they're a heater. So you don't want two heaters under the same blankets oh you should have separate covers you should yes okay. i'm sorry <laughs> okay i thought i was just taking them all 
<laughs> that's fantastic. You can do that, but you are your own. I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I know. Listen, mind my mind. I get it. I get ADD. Everything's fine. I yeah. want it all. I get it. And well, they're so good. They're like, yeah, just take the cups. Just yeah, take just take the covers. Like, it's fine. I want like, you to oh. be <laughs> It also makes sense that you really only need your blanket for your, your core because I'm someone who, like, my leg is out. My yeah. other leg might be out too, but I'm holding on to a blanket and, like, I will sleep with, like, a significant blanket all summer. Like, it's a whole thing. But because I, I just – I want my core to be covered. Um, but Rachel, do you think you could try that? Do you think you could? So I'm sold. I'm sold. She came I'm... into this podcast being can't. like, I don't know. She said can't at the beginning. Now yeah. sold. This is good. <laughs> I'm sold because I, because here's the thing. And I don't know if many people can speak differently, but like, I'm not satisfied with my quality of sleep. Yeah. I'm not satisfied with it. So if like, if I'm just going to keep on doing the same exact thing, that's the definition of insanity. Like if I'm just going to say, well, I can't do that. And what I'm doing is better. Well, obviously it's not because I'm not happy with how it's going. Yeah. So to me, this is just very exciting more than anything to think like there's a better mousetrap and I'm, I'm sold. That's great. I, you know, it, the first thing in, in like there's something that's called the golden handcuff phase when you're trying to change your paradigm yeah. and it's, so the first thing is introduction of a new paradigm or a new model. First thing everybody is going to do is resist it, right? So the first phase of changing your paradigms, no, 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 uh-uh, nope, can't be done. Now you, 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 take that, you take that new idea and then you stop playing with it. And then once that's called the golden handcuff phase because you don't want to let go of the way that you are, but you kind of like this way too. <laughs> So that goal in the handcuff phase is kind of the the the, the time where you start to intro, you start to use the new idea, and then once you're through that, now you have true transformation because you start to see. And with me, I wasn't sold on this. I hated back sleeping, right? I hated it, but I had a herniated disc and my leg was numb. And I reviewed three thousand X-rays and found, holy mackerel, it's due with any time I had forward head posture, and it, and it causes a reactive. Uh, ipsilateral one-sided psoas major muscle spasm the psoas is the only muscle in the human body that attaches directly to a disc so I, I i put two and two together i'm like holy crap i have i don't have a back issue i have a disc issue because i have forward head posture yeah. so i started jamming things underneath my neck rolled up towels to get my neck back and mine was if i didn't do it i wouldn't be able to practice again i wouldn't be able to mountain bike again i, I wasn't going to have surgery yeah. So my why was so big that I made myself do it. And then the transformation happened. I'm like, holy, I got to tell the, I got to tell the world what I figured yeah. out, you yeah. know? Well, when you find something life-changing like that, you're like, I just have to share this with the world. <laughs> like this changed my life. I got to tell everyone. Uh, I want to hit some like rapid fire questions with you for some people that are just thinking like, what are the things that I should change or before I go to sleep? Um, or what some of your thoughts on this are. So how does eating and drinking before bed affect your sleep? What kind of drinking? Um, we'll get to that. Okay. Let's just go regular. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so, so for, I'm only kidding. So you, you, uh, a byproduct of, of digestion is heat. And one of the things that our body needs to do in, 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 to get into deep sleep is our core temperature needs to drop about two degrees. And we want to be in deep sleep for the first third of our sleep cycle. So we want to be in deep sleep. So we want a heart rate. And another byproduct of digestion is an increased heart rate. So you have an increased heart rate, an increased metabolism. So those things elevate core body temperature. So you don't want to have much food in your system when you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and water, water, you want most of your hydration done during the day. You don't want to be waking up in the middle of the night and going to the bathroom. So we want to have, you know, a lot of people do a big glass of water before they go to bed. We really want to, you know, sway against that because you want to be able to, your bladder function starts to engage, right? It should be normally starting to engage right around 7, 8, 6, 30, 7 a.m., right? If, the, if we're waking up at 4 in the morning, which I, I trust me, I, it'll happen to me too, um, if, to get back to sleep, I don't have a problem with it, but a lot of people have a problem getting back to sleep when they wake up. So you want to have no more than three to 400 calories within three or four hours of going to bed. 
right? So you want to eat early. Your biggest meal of the day for me is uh, is lunch, and then my smaller meal is dinner. Very good. Um, on the temperature, is there an what what should our thermostats be set at? Is it universal? It's it, so it, it, that's such a, a a good. I mean, it's a question that you know most people agree on sixty eight degrees. I think it's a little too cold, sixty nine, seventy. But do those three degrees matter? It really doesn't. What really matters is, is I mean, I sleep with covers in, in the summertime. Yeah. And uh, because I, you have to understand, out, your body needs to maintain a core temperature of 98 degrees. If you're sleeping in a temperature of 70, that's, that's almost 30 degree difference. So if your body is fighting to stay at 98 degrees because it's trying to keep your core warm. It suppresses digestion, immune system, and reproduction. So people might get to sleep, but they're not getting good quality of sleep because of stimulating their sympathetic state. Remember I said one of the sympathetics or, or, or one of the survival systems is core body temperature. It will suppress immune system, digestive system, and reproduction to, to keep the body temperature cool. I mean, warm, mm-hmm. if it's fighting. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's that one of the reasons sense. people get sick during the winter time. Mm, that's true. Um, what are your thoughts about weighted blankets? Weight? Oh, really good. I mean, I like weighted blankets, right? Safety. We love safety. Um, but I, I use just thick, big. I like thick and big. I, I feel a little constraint with, with that weighted blanket. But um, I, I like thick and big. I like down. I mean, I just, I like that type of stuff. I like soft. Same. I have um, a da- I live in South Florida and I have a down blanket in the summer here. <laughs> Thermostat's at 69 and I have my down blanket. Like these are my checklists <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so I'm doing this right. You are. Um, Rachel, what do you a- think about a weighted blanket? Maybe you're trying it? Uh, yeah. I mean, me, I definitely try it because, because, you know, as as Dr. Martoni said, you know, if it's a safety issue yeah. and you want to create that counterweight mm-hmm. to, you know, not create it yourself with all your scrunching craziness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I totally see that because I also have like a super weird thing about like scrunching my face and like, I'll wake up with my fa- like, like sore in my face because I've been like scrunching it. It's just a whole ass weird thing. Um, <laughs> let's talk about alcohol for a second. Alcohol, sleep quality. Horrible. Ugh. Yep, horrible. So one of the issue, one of the, it, let's say somebody has a brain that they can't shut off. You, so a lot of people can shut it off with a glass of wine, right? Because it kind of. <laughs> Me. <laughs> you know? Damn it. Yeah, I love it. Oh my God, so great. You can do that Friday, Saturday, well, then Sunday, no, the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, uh. But, you know, it, it, it's, you're going to have REM rebound. You're going to have, like, vivid dreams. You'll have vivid dreams at the end of your sleep cycle. You go into a, a sleep, comatose sleep. You know, I guess if you do anything consistently, you can kind of get away with it. But here's kind of the rule of thumb. One hour to metabol- for your liver to metabolize one ounce of alcohol. So you don't want to have, and then that, al- that builds up. So if you want to have a glass of wine with dinner, not a big deal, Right. And, um, but if you are having a glass of wine within an hour of going to sleep, it's going to, it's going to torture. I'm learning so much. (laughs) Me too. I'm learning so much. Uh, Should we be tracking our sleep, like using a watch or a whoop or is it beneficial? Here we go. With our types of personalities, right? We love control, but we will get so damn competitive with ourselves yeah. that it'll upset us so much. Right. And we'll this be like, this oh, literally no, happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I get it. Um, you know, I'm so, you know, I will deteriorate my life that next day. I will, I will live a life of a 50. You know what I mean? Because I saw a 50 like this morning, my sleep score is a 93 and my readiness is a 93. So I'm like, ready to go. Now, you get that. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're good. But building up to that, what I tell people to do, listen, you can't improve what you don't track. Absolutely. I think tracking is important. You just, ha- you, you know, maybe even look at it a few days later, mm-hmm. but put the, put the, uh, put the uh, bands on, 
do a week of the bands or whatever you use, you know, ring a band or whatever it is, and then identify how you live that week. Right. And then like create patterns. Don't Mm -hmm. dive into, Oh my God, I didn't get deep sleep this night. I don't get deep sleep. I only get great deep sleep after I exercise that night. I'll get horrible sleep. I get it. I know I will. But the next sleep, I get much better deep sleep because I need to repair from all the damage I did with the the high intense exercise. Mm -hmm. So you'll start to identify that don't compare yourself to everybody else because everybody, oh my God, I got HRVs of like, you know, not 200. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Mm -hmm. And don't compare yourself to everybody else. But I do think it's important to know who you are, know how you feel. Then when you have a day that you're feeling really, really good identify what your scores are that day and then try to recreate it. And then, and then, so, so know you don't compare yourself to everybody else. Dude, that's just good life advice. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) sleep advice, life advice. Um, Should we be napping? Are naps bad? So naps are bad also, or if they're okay, I want to know what's the best time. Oh, you're the best. Look at you <laughs> diving right into my sweet spots. The best time goes with your core temperature. Any So our body is tied into circadian rhythm. So like when you when somebody gets sick, it's no coincidence that your fever is lower in the morning time and then rises around five or six o'clock. It's not that it, the virus is coming back. You, we have to understand cyclical cycles of our body and then you will understand how to how to treat your body and and that's a totally different podcast but treat your body very different so when we look at the cyclical energy of your body uh, or the core temperature you'll notice that your core temperature drops from noon time to like one o'clock most people believe that it's a food coma that's getting them tired it actually isn't it's the core in your body temperature dropping so when you have a drop in core temperature your body is going to get tired so, so there's a typical low of the day. That's why they, the Italians, how you doing? That's <laughs> why the Italians, I think, got it right. You eat, then you take a little bit of nap. I do nap. I nap, especially like I went, aw- I went away this week on my a daddy daughter uh, weekend. We were snowmobiling and 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 you know we were you know skiing and so I was up late. So I'll nap tomorrow. I don't have time to nap today. So I'll nap about twice a week to make up for lost REM sleep. Mm-hmm. Right to be able to get myself back, so I got no problem with napping. Napping every day because you're because you're getting bad sleep the night before. That like when you see all these things, oh, napping causes dementia. It's like they're looking at one frigging thing. They're not looking at the, the the loss of sleep that they're getting, and they're not putting it all together. Napping is very effective way to bring your body back on track. You shouldn't have to nap every day, but taking a little siesta right around the time when your body core temperatures drop, I have no problem with that. Is how there? Long? Do, yeah, how long? Because that's yeah. Because I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll just sleep. I'll wake up at six p.m. and go. Oh yeah. shit! <laughs> well, well, yeah. You, so that's a little issue. You 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 don't want to nap too late, right? You do want to nap right around that core temperature drop. So I mean, it's like an afternoon nap. But any you let your body choose. If you're dreaming and you nap, you you screwed up. You 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 had some four glasses of wine and your body needed to make up. <laughs> Normally, you should you should sleep and you really should, shouldn't need to dream, but your body will make up REM sleep. Um, but typically, 45 at 30 minutes to an hour is what most is you know back on track. Yep, yep, that's what I was thinking too. Just a, just a quick little. I'm a big like I could do a 30 minute just to, just a little reset. <laughs> like it's not yeah. like I don't go down for the count. Just like a little bit. And you have to like you have to block out an hour and be okay with that. So you yeah. have to give yourself the permission in the space to nap because I feel like oh my god I just got to get a nap in. Oh, I'll just I'll just I'll just lie here and then that rest isn't good enough. Yeah, it's uh, it falling asleep is what you really want to get done mm-hmm. uh, because if you're resting, you well, good, yeah, good. yeah. Uh, you talked about exercise a little bit. What kind of exercise is the best for sleep? Is there one? No, I, it, I mean, the best thing for sleep is, is, is consistency. Um, exercise typically late is horrible for sleep, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're elevating your core temperature, you elevate your core temperature stays elevated for up to two hours yep. after exercise could be even three hours, depending on your intensity. So you definitely want to exercise in the afternoon, but I mean, 
when you I'm we're looking at at balance, right? Overall balance. So so I love. I mean I I mean when you weight train, you're releasing HGH. You're doing your you know your legs, the big the big muscle groups are really where you get the most amount of improvement, I guess, in overall balance. But anytime you stress the system and create change. Your, it, your body is going to want to repair at night. So you want to be worn down. Think about a day when you're sitting on the couch all day long. It's so difficult to sleep yeah. because you, you, you didn't stress the body. So when you exercise on a regular basis, you sleep so much better because your body needs that downtime. And it's so important to get the downtime. If not, you'll be chronically fatigued and you'll have no energy during the day. Um, what, are, what are we thinking on supplements? melatonin, magnesium. There is a new supplement every single day on the market because sleep is an industry in which people want it so bad at they will pay any amount of money. Um, what are your, th- are, are there any supplements worth it? Should we be taking supplements? What's, what's happening? So I did create one. I fought myself in creating one because I'm not a big fan of supplements and sleep. Um, you know, I like patterns and in, in establishing patterns and, and because sleep should be normal and natural. The supplement we created, this isn't a, an advertisement for it, but I'll just tell you why I put what I put in there and, and then people can make their decision as to what they're doing. So I don't like melatonin. I don't like hormones that, that put you out, right? I just don't like it because your body, it, your body, it'll get used to it, but doesn't go through those natural cycles. I want your body to go through with consistency in your life naturally. So I like magnesium because magnesium settles the the, the brain down. I put a, a GABA. I like GABA because GABA kind of calms your system, allows our racing brains to stop thinking. But one thing I have at supplements called Deep Sleep that I put in that I really like is called L-Arginine, right? It cores the it dilates blood vessels so it cools the body mm-hmm. so when you put when you couple magnesium and then you couple serotonin and you add uh, l-arginine in there you're calming the body down and you're cooling the body down and that just promotes deep sleep that's the name of the supplement it's called deep sleep so when you're doing something and i've had people use effectively not with thc but cbd they've used cbd that calms their brain down i like that Anytime you're settling your system down, because most of the reason we can't get good sleep is because we are racing brains. So when you do something to affect that, I also teach people when they meditate or when they calm down, do it with a scent every time you do it. Then when you don't meditate and you use that scent, the body will calm the, the parasympathetic nervous system just smelling something. So there are different things that you can do to prepare. So I'm not always a big fan of the supplements that knock you out. Yeah. That's a, that's a great answer. I think we've learned a lot today in this podcast (laughs) and I think there's a lot to digest for a lot of people. Um, so I want them to know where they can hear more from you because this is going to be one of those things where like, I'm just continuously learning the more that you talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want them to know where they can hear more from you and where they can find you. Yeah, they can go to drsleepright.com. If they go there, there's a free sleep risk assessment that they can take to see how their lifestyle is affecting their health. And then um, they'll get the, op- the then uh, a free download will appear. It's the five pillars of sleep. These are the five things that you need to do to start getting great sleep. And then based on that, then we have different programs. We'll have a sleep program. And then we also, if you really want to dive in, I'd love to have you two involved in is the neurostructural sleep protocol. It's the way to look at somebody, read their neurology, tell them what's going on, and then you're able, you're looking at people differently. It will transform the way you look at people, and then you will see why sleep is so important and be able to help the structure and, and other things. Wow. Well, I mean, we, we did that, uh, you know, today and I, I just <laughs> had no idea that I was just sleeping as I am in my personality. My personality <laughs> is just an extension of my sleep. And um, that was just super eye opening. So Dr. Martoni, we have enjoyed this so thoroughly. I think our listeners are going to be blown away by your knowledge. So just thank you so much for taking the time today. It was really, really eye opening. Thanks. And really, again, thank you for all that you do, because 
really in this in this world our life is a product of our daily rituals and even just talking to you girls at the beginning and and how committed you are to helping people change those rituals i really uh, commend you on what you're doing thank you thank you so much Thank you.